Well, Dad isn't around anymore anyway, so. That's not something that can happen again then, is that? That's what it feels like. I feel like he cares about me less, I guess. Of course, the uh, ultimate disaster was the development of a new stem cell type of leukemia, which we identified after the, <clears throat> these many years of uh, therapy for the original leukemia. Uh, the evolution or the de novo appearance of the myeloid leukemia was uh, interpreted uh, as a death warrant. Good morning. I had found out um, on a Tuesday afternoon and uh, waited to tell Frederica and her brother and we were going to the circus with the parents group that night and I chose to wait until after that was over to tell Fred and her brother. And um, so it was about, I don't know, 12 o'clock at night when we talked about this. Um, Ed went off to school the next day and Fred and I kind of climbed into bed together and just held on to each other and cried. And that was a really special time for me, I know. Excuse me. What about for you? Yeah, it was. That whole morning was... Yeah. Felt really close. Like we were almost one person. It hit me. I heard it and I said, and it's all over, huh? And I started trying to look at the good side of things. Because that's all you can really do. And it's definitely like that. Uh, to yourself? Yeah, yeah. I started trying to be a little nicer to her and stuff. Mm -hmm. When she asked me to turn on the stereo, I didn't fight quite so much. <laughs> the scariest thing about having a kid with cancer is to... Um, one of them is to have that, know that there's going to be a point when that child is going to look at you and say, am I going to die? And um, all the pat answers don't apply. Well, everybody dies sometime. Which, like, <laughs> I mean, none of, all that's kind of garbage. And uh, Frederica had a relapse of her ALL about two and a half years ago, and at that point she asked me if she was going to die. And I could at least express uncertainty, which was that I didn't know and that people at the hospital were optimistic that they could again get her disease under control, but that there was no guarantee. However, this year in May when we had this diagnosis of AML, which is a second malignancy probably from her treatment, it really seemed as though there was no equivocation around the question that the fact that she is going to die of her leukemia feels like about 99% sure of this new kind of malignancy and that what we were talking about was perhaps a freaky chance that that might not happen, but really talking about how Frederica wanted the time to be between this point and when that leukemia is out of control and she dies. And that's a very different place to be in and it's very hard to get into the hope the way we could with the other relapse that yes, clearly there was something that could be done that would make a difference and that we could continue. I don't want to believe I'm going to die yet. Is it hard to hear your mother say that these things right now? It was when she said them before. Because that seems like right now, right here, you know? And, I mean, I was supposed to die when I was diagnosed. 
13 years ago. And I didn't. As far as I'm concerned, that's all that matters. As long as I'm not dead, I want to believe that there's a chance I'm going to survive. When I found out that Federico was, uh, that Federico was uh, chronically ill with it, finally, that she was really going to die, uh, I felt good that Mom found somebody, somebody else to help support her, because our tripod was decaying, you know, and I was going to be 18 a year from them, which I am now, and I was going to be leaving, and so I was really, I was kind of hoping that she would find somebody, and she did. This is my room. I've had it for three years now. It's the first room I've really gotten to plan, choose the colors for by myself. It's going to be hard to leave it. Uh, we're going to be moving fairly soon. I have to start all over again. I got this for Christmas a couple of years ago. We found it in a junk shop and brought it back and washed it and banged it together. It's fun to do the wallpaper and stuff, but I'm more interested in making the accessories or the furniture. This is a toothpick chair, which I made when I was experimenting with toothpicks as a wood form. Because <laughs> using large wood, it's hard to make fine mm -hmm. furniture. And these are my first attempt at upholstered furniture. One of my doctors gave this to me when she came back from Afghanistan as a present. And this I made in art a couple of years ago. I like it because it's so colorful. Oh, it's like sort of a representation of all, like the whole world, of the sun in the middle, and flowers and birds and deer, fish, a frog up top. The only thing that's not natural in this picture is the umbrella near the frog up there, and I didn't do that. The art teacher insisted on drawing that on. It didn't start to hit till I started thinking about the fact that they were going to get married. At first, I didn't take it too seriously. You know, she said, "Well, you know, we'll wait a year." And I thought to myself, well, a lot can happen in a year. Mm -hmm. And the date got moved up. Mm -hmm. And I started, I, well, I was thinking about it all the time. One of the things that hit me, well, will we be able to still live here? And of course we can't because Bill has his work where he's living now. Everything he does is right there. And this house isn't big enough for him and the two kids he had from the former marriage um, who spent every other week with him. So we'd have to move. <laughs> she wanted all of me, all of my attention. And she got a lot of it. And I, it's possible, I suppose, that she might have gotten all of me. I mean, uh, when I think about spring and I, I think about planting and, you know, so many of the things that are vitally part of me in my life are things that she chose to participate in. She became a great cook. Um, she really got involved in the yard and the gardening. Um, and those were things that, that feel like me. Um, and so there's a, you know, there's a kind of funny mixture of me, for me now of, uh, thinking about the garden, gardening and, and stuff and having that all mixed up with my memories of her. Um, but I'm not going to lose those things. They're not going to be so painful to me that I can't do them without her. Um, but she really didn't want to be without me. Um, th but the thing is, you know, I, I, I think that Basically, the bottom line is that we all want very much to believe that it's possible to be totally connected to another person. Uh, I think that's the final hedge against life. Um, you know, 
death doesn't happen, nor the awfulnesses of life don't matter if you're totally connected with another person. And the bottom line is that's not possible. Uh, I think that's what Frederick and I learned. I think Frederica learned that especially during that year. I think I knew that, but I wasn't really able to act on it. Um, but she gained her aloneness and her uniqueness, and I regained mine in that last time we had together, I think. Well, for instance, that question that I mentioned. Um, what was the question again? Yeah, why, why are we here? Why are we alive? You know, what's the point of being alive? Yeah, what's good of being alive? <laughs> when you get to that point, you say, oh, your, your mind's really in bad shape. <laughs> because uh, there isn't any end to that. And it's a terrible question. Because there probably isn't any reason. Yes. Uh, except to enjoy life. And you're obviously not doing that at the moment. So. Can you say a bit about why it's such a terrible question um, and why you think that there's no answer to it? <laughs> well, by the time you've, you're asking yourself something like that, you're basically asking yourself, why in the world do you exist? And, you know, you go over all the standard reasons in your head, you go, well, let's see, we're on the world to do good works for God. 